Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed a day that you have made and we rejoice in it. You have gathered us here in this place to worship you and to hear your word proclaimed. Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Thank you for the message you have given me for the day. I pray, Lord, it would be beneficial to many. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, we heard... For indeed, circumcision is of value if, that's a big if, you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be, <laughs> be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? Now, I have to admit that this particular passage and many of Paul's particular passages, sometimes you just need a diagram <laughs> to kind of help you understand what in the world he's talking about. It can get to be a little confusing. The bottom line is, is that our walk has got to be in line with our talk. So if we do not live what we say, we become hypocrites. By itself, circumcision did not benefit the Jews any more than wearing crosses benefits us. See, our lives are what speak volumes to a watching world. We also heard, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is none who does good, there is not even one. And just as all means all, none means none. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The law is needed, but it doesn't save. Thank God there is more for us. And this is what we also heard last week. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed through the law and the prophets. Already in Genesis, a book of the law, chapter 15, we saw that Abram, who lived before God gave the law to his people at Mount Sinai, Abraham believed, believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And then in the prophets in Habakkuk 2, 4, we read, the righteous shall live by faith. It is faith that saves, not works of the law. Yes, works are important, but they do not save. Justification is a gift of God. We receive this wonderful gift through faith in Christ Jesus. And since we are justified by faith in Jesus, where then is boasting? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, Paul actually answers this question by quoting Jeremiah 9, verse 23. He says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Why then is the Lord to be our boast? Because we, all people throughout the earth, we owe him everything. We owe him our lives. He's our creator. He's our redeemer. He's our sustainer. He's our provider. He's everything. That's why we boast in him. He's not only the God of the Jews. He's the God of all people. Jew or Gentile, Jesus died for all. Jesus did not nullify the law when he died and rose again. No, he fulfilled every, every, every single requirement of it. He did what we could never do. 
even to this day. We cannot do it. So chapter 4 is where we are now. And we've already touched on some of the first verses of this chapter, but what we're going to find in this chapter is Paul is now going to go into really great depth regarding Abraham, works, faith, circumcision, and uncircumcision. Depth that we need to hear in order to understand the difference between faith and works. Paul's not going to leave any stone unturned. He's going to really get into it. So chapter 4, verse 1 says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Do we understand that God has got an accounting department? His is kind of the galactic version of the accounting department. He records everything we say. He records everything we do. And everything we say and everything we do is going to be judged. The credit side of the ledger is going to be blank for every single person unless our faith, hope, Trust and confidence is in God alone. And if it's blank, we'll spend eternity apart from God. See, trusting in God is serious business. But you might want to ask, why aren't works accounted to the credit side of the ledger? Paul explains this. He says, this is verse 4, Now to the one who works... His wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. Every single person who has ever worked for a wage understands this. Whether a person's wage is distributed weekly, monthly, or whatever, the payroll department never, ever, ever puts a note at the bottom of the check which states this check is a gracious gift of the owner because he loves you. What? It's not going to happen. It's like, uh, no. I mean, you and the owner, we and the owner may have a really nice relationship with one another, but that paycheck is filled out and given to us because we worked for it. Somewhere along the line, you know, we got together with the owner of the business and negotiated the terms of the employment and the wage we'd receive for the work that we would do. I mean, what in the world would we ever work to warrant God ever giving us eternal life? It is not going to happen. I mean, even if we worked every single moment of every single day, seven days a week, 24-7, 365, or whatever, it is not going to be enough. So not one thing would ever grant us a wage of eternal life. And even if we could or would count our deeds as righteousness, God never would. He never would count any of our deeds as righteous deeds. Would you like to know what God's opinion of our righteous deeds is? It's found in Isaiah 64, verse 6 where we read, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like fil a filthy garment. Now, if we have forgotten exactly what is meant here when Holy Spirit moved, Isaiah, to use the word filthy garment, in this passage the meaning is quite graphic. Let me restate it using a word that's closer to the Hebrew. Isaiah writes, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a used minstrel cloth. Yuck! Yuck! Can we understand now how none of our deeds can be credited to us as righteousness? They aren't righteous. In fact, they're gross. Verse 5. 
But to one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. This is what David writes. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. All we can say to this is praise God, praise God, and praise God. Yes, blessed is though are those, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Verse 9. You know, Paul really wants to make it clear what he wants to say here about the circumcised or the uncircumcised. He says, is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited to him? How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while he was circumcised, but while uncircumcised. You see, God knows all. He looked down through the ages, and he saw that people would begin to misunderstand how righteousness would be credited to them. He saw that they would begin to think that righteousness would be something that they would do and not something that God would do. They would begin to see that somehow they would have to work in order to have righteousness credited to them, rather than see that it's a gift from God because of what he does, not because of what we do. So in great wisdom, God's work and timing in Abraham's life was such that Abraham believed God before he was circumcised. Now, we don't know how old Abraham was in Genesis 15. We know that the very next chapter is the chapter where Abraham and Sarah decided that, of course, they were Abram and Sarai at that point. They decided that God needed help in the procreation department, bringing about the child. Ishmael, Ishmael was born when Abraham was 86 years old. Okay? And then at the age of 99, just before Isaac is conceived, God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. Please, I'm going to read this section from Genesis 17, but please note that circumcision was a sign of a covenant between God and Abram. Here's what God said. This is Genesis 17, verse 11. And you shall circumcise in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised through your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants, a servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So Abram had walked with God for, by faith for 24 years before he was circumcised. So what then is circumcision if it's not a work? He tells us it's a seal. It's a seal. Paul states in verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, while he, well, which he had while uncircumcised. So it was a a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. Why did he receive the seal? So that he might be the father of, of all who believe without being circumcised. He was going to be the father of many nations. But at the point where Abram is called out of the nations, all nations were pretty much pagan. 
So the Lord's sign is seal is first so that the nations would know that they truly do belong to the Lord. So he gets this seal as an uncircumcised man. But he's also going to become the father of all the circumcised so long as both groups believe in God. But he starts with the uncircumcised. Say, yep, you're the father of these too. And to the circumcised, yep, you're the father of those. Because it's a seal, a sign of a covenant, a relationship. So Abraham is the father of all who walk by faith regardless of whether they are uncircumcised or circumcised. Verse 13 states, For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there is also no violation. I spent a good time... (laughs) I'm seeing it on your faces already. It's like, huh? I spent a lot of time with that yesterday. I am so grateful to Holy Spirit for clarifying that because now I can clarify it here. (laughs) And your faces tell me all I needed to know is that you're confused too says, okay, so for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. And that statement, but where there is no law, there is also no violation, it's very interesting. And we might be led to wonder why God gave the law if it leads to wrath. I mean, wouldn't it be nice not to be lawbreakers? Yes, it would. However, however, and this we've got to know, we would still be just as guilty of sin even if there was no law. Because you see, we're descendants of Adam and Eve. And they sinned without the law. The law was given... You know, as we've talked before, the law is given as a mirror, as a guide, you know, as a curb. It's given to show us that we need a Savior. But just because there might not be a law doesn't mean that we're not guilty. And Paul would go on to say later on, I think it is in uh, Romans, he's, you know, that... He's thankful for the law because the law showed him that he was a lawbreaker. You see, if there's no law, then we can go around thinking, well, I didn't do that. You can't count it. You can't account that sin to me because there is no law. God gives the law. He gives us the ten, and we can literally go down those ten and go, have I done this, 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 and this? Or have I not done this, 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 and this? And we can see, oh, and we need that. We need that mirror. But rest assured that if there was no law, we'd still be guilty. (laughs) We'd still be guilty. Was receiving the law important? Absolutely. But the law doesn't say. Now, verse 16 rather, is the beginning of something very interesting, a very, very long sentence. It's about 90 words long. And so I'm going to read through it, but then I'm going to do something else with it. Verse 16 states, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants of Abraham, both physical and spiritual descendants, uh, guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. 
as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him who he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Okay. Paul has a lot of asides, parenthetical statements, asides in this particular passage. And the best thing that we can do to understand the bottom line of what he's trying to do is get rid of the asides, take them away for a little bit, so that we can take the initial statement and couple it to the closing statement so that we can see the point he's trying to make. Okay? It's not that the asides aren't important, but they get in the way of our being able to understand his point. So this is what Paul is saying. For this reason, it is by faith, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all Abram's descendants in the presence of him who he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. For this reason, it is by faith, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all Abraham's descendants. Once you know that, then you can go back in and grab the asides and see all the other things he wants to include in that. But Paul really goes to great lengths to get his point across that faith, not the law or works of the law, it's faith that guarantees the promises of God. Verse 18. In hope against hope, Abraham believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was, also, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake only to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, what's he saying here? Abraham, Abraham believed that God could give him an heir even though he was about 100 years old. He believed the impossible, the physically impossible. God had promised, Abraham said, I'm taking you up on that promise and I'm going to believe you. This verse says that that's not what we get credited into our ledger as righteousness. What gets credited to us is our faith in the Lord Jesus, our faith that God raised him from the dead. It is that belief, that faith, that gets credited to us as righteousness. You see, along the line, you know, as God has worked throughout the generations, there have been times that he has come to people and said, this is what I want you to do. And when we walk by faith, that gets credited to us as righteous, righteousness. But the big umbrella item is faith that God really did raise Jesus from the dead. As we believe that, that's the one that gets credited to us as righteousness. That gets tallied in that credit column, and that's the one that leads to life eternal with God. That's where we're going to stop today. That's a lot, you know, and really, it'd be great to have, a, have charts and graphs and lines and all this sort of stuff, but uh, we're going to stop there, and yes, I know there is one more verse to go in this chapter. I know this. I'm not leaving it out. I'm starting next week with it. Amen.